Oh, Lord, our God, you are great and mighty and powerful and holy and just, and you are good, and you are kind and merciful, and you are our shepherd. We're so thankful for the reminders of the ways that you care for your people, that you are the good shepherd who would lay down his life for the sheep. You are the shepherd who knows his sheep and calls his sheep to himself. We're thankful for the reminders we've had in the last weeks of your sweet, tender care for us. Your willingness to be a host who richly, lavishly supplies us with far more than we could hope for in lavish grace and bountiful kindness. We pray this morning as we look to your word that you would shepherd us still, that you would lead us to the truths that you have laid out for us in your kind, gracious self-disclosure. For you desire to be known for all of your beauty and goodness and holiness, and you desire that we would know you. And we pray to that end that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would understand that we would love and cling to what you say. We ask for your help in it this morning, in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. I invite you to turn in your Bibles this morning to Romans chapter 10. We're finding our way back to the book of Romans, and we'll be walking forward from verse 5 this morning. There are two paths in life, two roads, and while these paths and roads bear some similarities, they really couldn't be any more different from each other, any more opposite than each other. Their, their destinations are infinities apart from one another. There is, in fact, an infinite chasm that separates these two paths. At one moment, you're on one side, and you get born again by grace, and instantly you're on the other side. And we have neighbors living just in the next door that are separated from us by this infinite chasm. Family members that we live with, perhaps, or are close to, who are infinities apart from us on another path, and you can only be on one or the other, and it makes all the difference between life and death eternally, which path you are on. And we're talking this morning about two divergent paths that the Apostle Paul describes in Romans chapter 10, a path of law righteousness and a path of faith righteousness. Let's read together. Our text this morning is Romans 10, 5 through 10, but we'll pick it up in verse 4. Paul writes, For Christ is the end of law for righteousness to everyone who believes. For Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness which is based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith which we are preaching, that if you confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. For with the heart a person believes, resulting in righteousness, and with the mouth he confesses, resulting in salvation. We have here the two paths laid out for us by the Apostle Paul, who very clearly walked the one path as good as anybody and was rescued from it to walk the other path. <laughs> 
The connection in verses 5 to 10 begins with the word for there in verse 5, connecting us to verse 4. It is the explanation for why Jesus Christ is the end of law for righteousness. Law for righteousness is that attempt to merit a right standing before God by keeping the rules, by doing good, by following the standard. Now, why does law for righteousness come to a screeching halt at the person and work of Jesus Christ? Why does it terminate in Jesus? And Romans 10, 5 to 10 is the explanation for verse 4. Why is Christ the end of law for righteousness? Well, because, verse 5, Moses writes all the way down through verse 10. And what's displayed here in verses 5 to 10 are are the two paths that diverge in the middle of your life. Two paths that diverge in the middle of your life. One path called law righteousness and another path called faith righteousness. And the question for us this morning is, which path are you on? And maybe for you this morning, the question is, which path will you walk down? Which path will you walk down? I believe this text is extremely personal not only for the Apostle Paul, but for all of his readers, for us, and it is of extreme importance, the ultimate importance, the most important thing a human being could consider, this question before us of these two paths. We're going to look at the first one at least this morning. I'd like to get to the second. Uh, We'll make an attempt to do so. The first path is this path of law righteousness. And and the thing you need to understand about this first path, which is detailed for us in verses 5 through 7, is that on the path of law righteousness, salvation is impossible. On the path of law righteousness, salvation is impossible. Put your eyes on verses 5 to 7. Paul writes, for Moses writes that the man who practices the righteousness based on law shall live by that righteousness. But the righteousness based on faith speaks as follows. Don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. And then verse 8 begins for us a very hard, stark contrast with the word but. And while verses 5 to 7 display for us a righteousness out of law, verses 8 to 10 will display for us a righteousness out of faith. And these couldn't be more different. Paul says literally in verse 5, with reference to a righteousness out of law, Moses writes. Specifically, Moses is not writing In Leviticus 18.5, which we'll look at in a moment, Moses is not writing about the problem of trying to be justified by law. That's not Moses' point. But Paul is saying, with reference to a righteousness that comes out of law, I want you to hear Moses' point. I want you to hear what Moses is getting at. And and so he turns our attention to Leviticus 18.5, and I want us to turn there this morning. It's critical that we understand the context that Paul is drawing from. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus. If you start at the beginning of your Bible, you're three books over. Page 123, if you're Ben James, who has the exact same Bible that I have. I don't know what page it is for the rest of you. Leviticus 18.5. And there, God, speaking through the prophet Moses, says... So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. I am Yahweh. There's some pretty clear instructions from God predicated on the very nature of who God is. Remember, Yahweh is that covenant-keeping, self-existent God, and Yahweh is his personal name that reveals that nobody created him. He just is and that he enters into loving, gracious, kind relationship of redemption and revelation of himself to his people in covenant promise. 
All of that is bound up in that name Yahweh. And God reveals himself and then predicates this injunction for his people. So you shall keep my statutes and my judgments by which a man may live if he does them. Notice that Moses does not make a reference to righteousness. Moses does not say, you may merit a perfect standing of righteousness if you keep my rules. He's not explaining here, how does one get to heaven? If you keep my rules perfectly, you'll get to heaven. Many commentators take his words that way because of Romans 10.5. But that is not at all Moses' point, nor is it Paul's point in quoting it. Let's back up just a little bit and, and think about what Moses is saying or what the Lord is saying through Moses in Leviticus 18, beginning in verse 1. Then Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, I am Yahweh your God. You shall not do what is done in the land of Egypt where you lived, nor are you to do what is done in the land of Canaan where I am bringing you. You shall not walk in their statutes You are to perform my judgments and keep my statutes to live in accord with them. I am Yahweh your God. And then God goes on to explain some of the things he expects of his people. God is saying, I rescued you out of Egypt. Do do you remember Egypt? (laughs) He's speaking to the generation that would have experienced these things. You were enslaved in Egypt, and you groaned under that slavery, and God, by his grace, entered in and rescued you, Israel. I brought you out of there, and and I brought you out of there, not so that you would keep on doing what the Egyptians did, not so that you would follow their ways and worship their gods and, and walk in their immoralities and their unfaithfulnesses to the creator of all things. I brought you out to be different to be set apart, to be mine, says the Lord. And you're going into the land of Canaan, which you don't deserve. In fact, the, the, the people who live there are going to be judged by me for their wickedness. You, you don't get to go there because you're better than them. In fact, you're not. Um, but I'm taking you in there by my grace. And so when you get there, I don't want you to live like the Canaanites either. I don't want you to live like the Egyptians where you came from, nor the Canaanites where you're going. I I want you to live in fidelity to me. That is the message of Leviticus 18. And so when Moses gets to verse 5, what God is saying through Moses to the people is, listen, you get to live in the land if you obey. You get to be blessed by me, by grace. You get to prosper, and, and, and the, the book of the law describes the blessings that God is eager to pour out on his people if they will simply remain in fidelity to him, walk in his ways. That is the command of Leviticus 18.5. If you follow my directives, I will let you live in the land and you will prosper. And the reason Moses doesn't mention righteousness here is because he's not talking about eternal life and he's not talking about meriting righteous standing before God. As if God would speak through the prophet Moses something that he would then have to disagree with later in the Bible. This, in fact, reveals some of the very good purposes of the law of God. Why was the law given? Well, the law brings God's undeserved favor near to his people whom he rescued. The law made provision for undeserving sinners to actually be near God, to enjoy his presence, uh, to follow his directives and, and have him close to them. He would be their anchor and their rock and their shepherd and their fortress and all these things close in their midst. The law allowed all of that gracious provision from God. The law brought about God's blessings if they would simply obey him. They would be blessed and they will have God himself near to them. And the law allowed them to understand what is acceptable to God. To know what God expects. What is God like and what is God not like? What does he love and what does he hate? We, we better find ourselves in faithful fidelity to him. That would be good. If he is good and does good, we, we need to recalibrate our definitions of what is good. We don't think that naturally, so God, thank you for telling us what is right. The law does that. Additionally, the law reveals the character of God, the very ways of God, what he is like in his self-disclosure to his people. 
And the law promotes the love of what is good and the hatred of what is evil. And the law was also designed to produce a recognition of need. <coughs> Excuse me. Can I? So sorry for the uh, distraction. I think I sang too loud. <laughs> the law of God was also designed to demonstrate a significant need that sinners don't have in themselves what it takes to meet God's righteous standard. Every time God reveals himself to his people and then regulates their lives in a good, gracious way, God's people are still left with the discovery that oh, I've still got sin. <laughs> I'm still in need of a savior. I might have been rescued out of Egyptian slavery, but I still have problems in my heart. You and I on this side of the cross would say, I've still been rescued by Christ from my slavery under the power and dominion of sin, but I still have residual presence of sin in my life. I still have need. Some have limited the law's purpose only to that recognition of need, as if the only reason God gave the law was to point you to Christ. Now, that's not the biblical projection of the purpose of the law. The law had many purposes. That is one of its purposes. And for all of the goodness of the law of God, for all of its beauty, for all of its capabilities, for all of its purposes, the law was never given to produce a right standing before God in the life of a sinner. That is not one of the law's purposes. It never has been. And it never could be. It could never provide righteousness to a sinner. Why? Because we are all lawbreakers. And once you've broken the law, guess what? The law stands broken. You can't fix it. A lawbreaker can't fix a broken law. But one who breaks the law by nature you see, law-breaking, transgression, sin, it comes out of who we are at the very foundational level, at the heart level. What we love and what we think and how we're naturally driven and our motivations. And we got all of that from birth. You can blame your parents. And they would blame theirs all the way back to Adam and Eve. This law-breaking is natural to us, and, and no law-breaking sinner can fix the law once it's broken. James makes that point. If you break the law at any one point, you've broken the whole thing. It doesn't matter if you say, I've never done this, that, or the other thing. You did this, that, and that other, other thing, and it's too late. You're a lawbreaker. So the law could never provide righteousness to a sinner. It was never the law's purpose. The law is something of a great tool, a great implement with specific purposes by design, but justification is not one of those designs. A, a declaration that a sinner is righteous is something the law could never do. What can the law only do? Declare that a sinner is a sinner. <laughs> Now, Romans 7 gives some other features of that. Not only does the law show us what the standard is, but incites sin in us to break that standard and then condemn us for having broken it. <laughs> Any hope that you could be justified by law-keeping is a vain, empty hope. And yet, it is the hope that everybody on this path of law righteousness holds. It is the innate hope of humanity that somehow my good deeds could outweigh my bad deeds, that if I do something wrong, I can go to church and kind of dress it up a little bit. It's part of the disease of sin that we think this way. The law in any era is good. The law of God is not legalism. Do you understand that? The law of God is not legalism. Some people would, uh, anytime you put out some injunction from God, God says to do this, or Jesus says to do this, or the Apostle Paul in Ephesians 4 says to do this, people say, oh, that's legalism. No, the law of God's not legalism. Read the book of Deuteronomy. When the law itself was given, God unfolds the gracious purposes of his instruction for his people in revealing himself to them and regulating their lives. 
that when people who have been rescued by God out of love for God and submission to his authority desire to obey his directives, that's not legalism. (laughs) Obedience is not legalism. What did Jesus say? If you love me, you keep my commandments. It's a matter of love. And Christian, today there's blessing for you if you obey God's directives. (laughs) Of course there's blessing for you. Listen, life gets really, really hard when you disobey God. The corollary to that is the hard things you would experience through disobedience don't happen quite the same way when you obey. There's blessings in front of you for obedience. And the ones who have been declared righteous by grace through faith, while they're not declared righteous by their obedience, no, their obedience flows out of a declaration by grace through faith of their right standing before God. But they've also been made to walk in the good works that God prepared in advance for them to walk in, Ephesians 2.10. And there's great blessing, even temporal blessing, blessings we live in now when we follow God's instructions. We should not think of this as so different than God's gracious law giving to his rescued people in the Old Testament. Life gets harder when you chafe against God's directives. It does. Consider this significant blessing of obedience from Jesus' lips in John 14, 21. He who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. Right? You get that? You can't say, I love Jesus, but I don't want him to tell me what to do. No, the one who keeps his commandments is the one who loves him. And then listen to this. He who loves me will be loved by my father and I will love him and will disclose myself to him. You want deeper, richer experiences of the love of God and the self-disclosure of Jesus Christ in personal relationship. It's going to be found in faithful, loving, submissive obedience to his directives. What a tremendous blessing that is. It's good. Desire to submit to my Lord and to love my Savior through obedience is not legalism. Legalism is the attempt to purchase God's approval with the trash and refuse of your own so-called merit. That's legalism. And it usually turns, after you've decided, look, I can purchase my own merit before God by the stuff I do, it usually turns to judgmentalism as you point your finger at the other people who aren't quite as pretty as you on the outside. That's legalism. That was the legalism that Paul was dealing with in his own day. That was the legalism that Jesus was addressing in Matthew 23. That was the empty religious system that the Jewish leaders led in Jesus' day. Do you know how many times I've I've heard this sentence? Your flathead screwdriver is not a pry bar. You may not know how many times I've heard that sentence. I've heard that sentence a lot of times. Uh, My dad said that to me on numerous occasions, and when I was in mechanic school, um, I heard that more times than I can count. Flathead screwdriver is not a pry bar. Do you know how I know it to be true? As many times as I heard it, (laughs) let me tell you how I know it to be true. My screwdriver drawer is kind of filled up with screwdrivers that are bent at a 45 degree angle. I know they're not pry bars. I know that by experience. It's a good tool, but for the wrong job. If Moses isn't talking about law keeping for meriting righteous standing before God for eternal life, then why does Paul quote Leviticus 18.5 when Paul wants to talk about righteousness by law? You see, in Romans 10, Paul is still dealing with the problem of Israel. In Paul's day, Israel had en masse rejected Messiah. Turn back to Romans. These should be familiar sentiments to us by now, but listen to Romans 9, 1 to 4. Paul says, I'm telling the truth in Christ. I'm not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. I wish that I myself were were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh, who are Israelites. To whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises, whose are the fathers and from whom is the Messiah, the Christ, the Christ. 
according to the flesh, who is overall God blessed forever. When God took on flesh in the person of Jesus Christ, he came as a Jew. He came in the line of Israel. All of these immense privileges and the tragedy of rejecting Messiah when he came. Let's skip ahead to verse 30 of chapter 9. What shall we say then that Gentiles who did not pursue righteousness attained righteousness, the righteousness of faith, but Israel, verse 31, pursuing a law righteousness did not arrive at it. Why? Verse 32, because they didn't pursue it by faith, but as though it were by works, they stumbled over the stumbling stone, Jesus Christ. This is a tragedy. Chapter 10, 1 to 3, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them, for Israel, is for their salvation. I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge, for knowing about God's righteousness, for not, excuse me, for not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own. How are they seeking to establish their own? By law keeping. Therefore, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. The righteousness of God that comes by faith is a free gift, and they didn't subject themselves to it because they were busy establishing their own. Tragic. Again in chapter 10, down to verse 21. As for Israel, God says, All the day long I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and obstinate people. Chapter 11, verses 1 and 2. I say then, God has not rejected his people, has he? May it never be. I too am an Israelite, descendant of Abraham, the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. And then all of chapter 11 is a discussion of, okay, what does that mean? God hasn't rejected them. And Paul will explain that. And in Paul's day, Jews who had not embraced Jesus as Messiah held on to a confidence simply because they possessed the law of Moses. Yeah, we we have that document. Well, does that mean you're a law keeper? Only in a sense that you're keeping the scroll in which the law is written, but not in the sense that you're actually maintaining the standards the law requires. And they had a false confidence in their conformity to the law of Moses. Again, in in Romans, back to Romans chapter 2, Paul writes of them, therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment, you legalists, for in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. You who judge practice the same things. And we know that the judgment of God rightly falls upon those who practice such things. Do you suppose this, O man, that when you pass judgment on those who practice such things and yet do the same yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? And Paul has the Jews in the scopes having been exactly in the same boat, seeking to establish his own righteousness by law-keeping, discovering that he was a flagrant hypocrite with nothing to offer God. Romans chapter 2, verse 17. If you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God, and you know his will and approve the things that are essential being instructed out of the law, and you're confident that you yourself are a guide to the blind, a light to those who are in darkness, a corrector of the foolish, a teacher of infants, having in the law the embodiment of knowledge of truth, you therefore who teach others, do you not teach yourself? And he goes through a list of the hypocrisies. They actually were using the law of Moses for a job it was never intended to accomplish. Romans 9.31 and 10.3, to establish their own righteousness by it. When the law could do no such thing. The law would never yield to establishing their righteousness. You're breaking me, you're breaking me. I can't uphold you and justify you as a law keeper. The tragic irony is that the nation had actually gone into exile precisely because they had not obeyed God's law. God's promise was, listen, if you just remain faithful to me, you can live in the land and I'll bless you. I love you. But listen to how other portions of the Old Testament use Leviticus 18.5. The prophets use it as an indictment against Israel looking back from the time of the exile. And their claim is the reason you're in exile the reason you don't get to live in the land and be blessed and prosperous is because you didn't obey. 
Ezekiel 20, 11. I gave them my statutes and formed them of my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. Reference to Leviticus 18, 5. But the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They rejected my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. Another quote from Leviticus 18, 5. My Sabbaths they greatly profaned, and I resolved to pour out my wrath on them in the wilderness. Ezekiel 20, 21. But the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes, nor were they careful to observe my ordinances by which if a man observes them, he will live. They profaned my Sabbaths. I resolved to pour out my wrath on them to accomplish my anger against them in the wilderness. Nehemiah 9, 29 echoes the same sentiment. They acted arrogantly and did not listen to your commandments, but they sinned against your ordinances by which if a man observes them, he would live. They turned a stubborn shoulder and stiffened their neck and would not listen and as you rehearse Israel's history in your own mind, you, you, you know that's true. They, they entered the land of Canaan, and what did they do? They worshiped every god under the sun, on every high hill and under every green tree. They are worshiping all the gods of the land in which they entered. They did not keep covenant. They were not faithful to Yahweh who had rescued them. And the exile was the punishment for that very thing. Israel's disobedience to God's law explains the exile. The reason that Israel was removed from the land, removed from the blessing and the prosperity that was available to them by God's grace is precisely because they did not obey. Now, there's evidence to suggest that in Paul's day, Jewish leaders still considered themselves to be in exile. You think, wait a second, didn't they live in Israel? Uh, weren't they headquartered in Jerusalem? Well, yes, though they lived in the land of Israel, they, they were not a sovereign nation nor had they been since their captivity in Assyria and Babylon. The Medes, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, the Romans in Paul's day ruled their land. They were subject. They, they, they weren't their own nation. And the Jewish leadership considered themselves still in exile. In fact, the Bible would have called this era the times of the Gentiles. Leviticus 18.5 is not about how a sinner gets to heaven, but how does the nation of Israel, rescued from Egyptian slavery, get to enjoy God's blessing in the land of the Canaanites? By submitting themselves to God's gracious direction. And they didn't want it. And they didn't do it. So for a Jew in Paul's day to try to use Mosaic law as his credential for getting into heaven was doubly tragic. Right, he's misusing the law altogether. That's not what the law of Moses was for. It could never be for getting into heaven. For a lawbreaker by nature to employ that tool to try to get to heaven is the height of hypocrisy and foolishness. And now that the law of Moses was no longer in operation, you see, Christ came and, and very soon, from Paul's perspective, the, the temple was soon to be demolished and the sacrificial system would go down and it has been down for nearly 2,000 years. Israel can't today follow the law of Moses. It's defunct. It's inoperative. And Israel is still in exile. For a Jew in Paul's day to claim, I keep the law for my righteousness, is to lie before men and before God. Now, there's no way that their law keeping could attain the absolute perfect standard of righteousness that God demands for entrance into heaven. And yet he says, I got this. It's the car mechanic with a garage full of bent flathead screwdrivers. And he's using them for all kinds of things. Oh, it's a floor jack. It's an engine hoist. It's a hammer. It's a pry bar. He does his electrical work with it, his engine timing, his upholstery repair, and the window cleaning. Now, are you going to take your brand new luxury sedan into that mechanic when you get your first scratch on the driver's side door? He's standing there waiting for your business in his garage, holding the only tool he uses. And he's broken it, bent it all out of shape. It was a good tool designed for specific purposes, but he's going to try to repair the scratch pane on your new car's door with a bent flathead screwdriver. I don't think so. But this is the issue that Paul is addressing in Romans 10.5. It is the human predicament. We naturally try to solve the problem of my irrepressible law breaking with sham attempts at law keeping. I got this. 
Well, faith righteousness has something to say about that. Look down at verse six. In verses six and seven, we're still dealing with law righteousness. But Paul kind of gets ahead here and, and he wants to speak against law righteousness by personifying faith righteousness. It's like the, the truth is gonna interrupt here to expose the falsehood. And notice how Paul does this in verse six. But the righteousness out of faith speaks as follows. This is kind of clever. You can't get to heaven by a law righteousness. Wrong tool, wrong job. Faith righteousness wants to tell you something about that. And then faith righteousness exposes law righteousness for what it is. Impossible. The righteousness out of faith speaks as follows. And here's what faith righteousness has to say. Verse six, don't say in your heart who will ascend into heaven, that is to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is to bring Christ up from the dead. What does faith righteousness have to say about law righteousness? It's a prohibition. Don't do this. And, and he alludes to Deuteronomy 8, 17. I want you to turn there. This context is so fascinating. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8.17. God says again through Moses, otherwise you might say in your heart. And then look down at 9.4. Deuteronomy 9 verse 4. Do not say in your heart. And then a prohibition about what you shouldn't be saying in your heart follows both of those. In 8.17, the prohibition is this. Don't say in your heart, my power and the strength of my hand made me this wealth. And in 9.4, don't say in your heart when Yahweh your God has driven them out before you. It's because of my righteousness that Yahweh has brought me in to possess the land. Don't say that. Both of these prohibitions are a prohibition against the pride of self-accomplishment, the very thing that Paul is talking about in Romans 10. It's a command to remember grace. You don't deserve to be in this promised land. So when you get there, don't forget Yahweh and don't claim that you got there because you achieved it. Don't claim that you got there because you earned it or you deserved it. That is off limits. You don't deserve this. You're a sinner. And God puts you there by his grace. Paul invokes this phrase very intentionally. He's quoting Moses. He's quoting the law, the Pentateuch, this time in Deuteronomy. And he's not pitting Moses against Moses. He's not putting Deuteronomy against Leviticus. In fact, he's using all of these Old Testament references to bolster the same point. Establishing your righteous standing before God on the basis of your ability to keep God's law is impossible. So don't say in your heart, you got here because of you, because of your efforts, or because of your goodness. And then next in Romans 10, verse 6, he quotes another portion of Deuteronomy. Uh, flip over to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And he appeals to verse 12. And there Moses writes, it is not in heaven that you should say who would go up to heaven to get it for us. Now this is a, a remarkable chapter. Deuteronomy 12, Deuteronomy 30 verse 12 is spoken by God through Moses to let the people know of God's gracious self-disclosure in his drawing near to them and speaking with them. That his ways and his blessing and his word are right there for them. That they don't have to transgress the distance between earth and heaven to go get it somehow. That would be impossible. But God himself in his grace and condescension, humility and love has come down to give it to them freely. What grace. Grace. 
What kindness. This is Moses' point here. And again, this is demonstrating the, the grace of the law given in the Old Testament. These were not rules just to prove that you can't keep them. This was God's gracious self-disclosure and the regulation of his people for their good. Undeserved favor. God wants to be near and God has made a way. And what's so fascinating about Deuteronomy 30 is where it sits in Deuteronomy. Back in Deuteronomy 10, God gave a charge to the people of Israel. He said, circumcise your hearts and stiffen your necks no longer. He gives them a, a command they can't possibly keep. How am I supposed to do an internal, spiritual, surgical procedure on the inner makeup of who I am? My, my thoughts, my mind, my heart, my desires. How, how am I supposed to change who I am by nature? I, I can't do that. And yet the command from God is an absolutely good one. It's a reasonable one. In fact, in Deuteronomy 10, the reasonableness is set up. God says, listen, you don't deserve this, but it's very reasonable for you to circumcise your heart towards me because the universe belongs to me. All the rest of the universe obeys me and does what I say. <laughs> How much more reasonable is it that my creatures made in my own image would do the same? It's not an unreasonable command for God to say, circumcise your hearts and stiffen your necks no longer. But it is an impossible one for hard-hearted, stiff-necked people to obey. <laughs> because you can't change your nature. And Deuteronomy 10 is a precursor, a setup for the promise in Deuteronomy 30, verse 6, where God says, I will circumcise your hearts, Israel, so that you will obey. This is the new covenant. We thought the new covenant wasn't coming till Jeremiah 31. No, it comes all the way back at the beginning of the giving of the law. All the way back in Deuteronomy. Before the people are even in the land. Before they've even broken covenant and chased and served all the false gods of the Canaanite religions. God says... Here's my command, circumcise your hearts. You will disobey me. You will fall away. You won't receive the blessings I've offered to you. You will receive the cursings of exile and dispersion and judgment. And I will bring you back and I will circumcise your hearts and then you will obey me from the heart. And what you and I as Gentile believers, most of us in this room, experience in Jesus Christ are the benefits of new covenant spiritual promises promised to Israel that we get to revel in in Christ as a down payment of the fullness of his promise to keep the new covenant with Israel itself. That's what's so fascinating about Paul giving this promise and quoting Deuteronomy 30 in the context of Romans 9 to 11, where Paul is explaining the present problem of Israel and the future hope of Israel, that God himself will redeem them and bring them to himself, not in their present state, but transform them spiritually, nationally, circumcise their hearts to bring them to himself. Something they can never do on their own. And Paul is appealing to this very context to say, it's right here, Israel. It's right here and available to you. And yet in Romans chapter 10, he universalizes this to all of humanity. <laughs> To humanity trapped and stuck on the weary trail of the path of law righteousness. Burdened by sin, unable to shake the shackles of slavery. In desperate need of a light burden and easy yoke. Desperate need of someone else to bear the burden and carry the guilt and bring us by grace into the love of God. And Paul employs this very concept in Romans chapter 10 to say, it's right here. You don't have to ascend into heaven. And what Moses was describing is, you don't have to go to heaven to get it. It's, it's right here and it's available. This gets narrowed down and focused even more tighter. And what Paul means by this here is to bring Christ down. Do you see that in verse 6? Don't say in your heart, listen, faith righteousness doesn't say this. I guess I got to get to heaven and find my own savior and bring him down here and bring about my own rescue. This is a reference to the incarnation. No sinner was ever going to come up with the plan. You know what I need? I'm so wicked that the only hope for me, I'm so helpless. I'm so hopeless. I'm so spiritually dead that the only solution for me 
is that God himself would take on flesh, come down here as a man, and bear my sin on my behalf. That's, that's my only hope. Let's do that. God, what do you think about that plan? Nobody thought of that. And even if someone had thought of it, nobody could accomplish it. The audacity of such a thought that the sinless, beautiful, beloved Son of God would become sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. We dare not. And yet, this was God's plan. And this is what God did. Listen, sinner, you can't do the impossible. You can't go up to heaven and bring Christ down and enact the incarnation to effect your own rescue. God did this. And this becomes even more clear when Paul gets to the response of faith in a, in a belief at the heart level and a confession at the mouth level that we believe that God raised him from the dead. That is, God's the one responsible for the whole process of Messiah coming down, dying on a cross, and rising from the dead. Paul continues in verse 7. Don't say, who will descend into the abyss? <laughs> who will descend into the abyss? Again, probably a reference to Deuteronomy 30, 13, the next verse in Deuteronomy 30, which continues the prohibition against attempting the impossible. What Moses says is, you don't have to cross the sea or the deep. You don't have to go across the deep to go get God's revelation, God's grace, God's kindness to you. Paul wants to say more than Moses did. It's not changing Moses' meaning, but he's picking up language from Psalm 107, 26. Listen to this. The psalmist writes, they rose up to the heavens, they went down to the abyss. They went up and they went down. And the word for the deep is translated in the Greek New Testament to the word abyss. And the Greek word uh, for the English word abyss is abyss. There you know a Greek word. Uh, you're a little bit ahead. Um, and it's very clear that, that Paul wants to say more than you don't have to cross an ocean to go get Messiah. Paul wants to say you don't have to go down into the abyss. And let me tell you what I'm talking about, says Paul in verse 7. That is to bring Christ up. It's a reference to the resurrection. You couldn't go into the abyss, that is the grave, and raise Jesus. Now, no one in this room was thinking, yeah, I bet I could have. <laughs> it's a ridiculous statement, but it gets at the very heart of the human problem. You see, we're naturally born thinking we are good enough to do what's required, that we do have what it takes to affect our entrance into heaven. We're born naturally thinking too highly of ourselves, thinking too lowly about what sin is, and thinking horrible thoughts about the holiness and righteousness and justice and beauty and goodness and glory of God. And we think we've got what it takes. I got this. No. You couldn't go up to heaven to bring about the incarnation, and you couldn't go into the grave to bring about the resurrection either. These things are impossible. The things you needed most desperately, were impossible. And yet, these are the things that God does. God has fully accomplished what is required for believers to get to heaven. God has done what is impossible for us, but dreadfully necessary. And the resurrection here is shorthand for the finished work of Christ in paying for our sin at the cross. You see, rising from the dead presupposes that Jesus died. His resurrection from the dead just assumes his death to begin with. And Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that Jesus is stronger than death. It also demonstrates that Jesus was not a sinner who could only die for his own sins. But no, he was the perfect, sinless, incarnate son of God. Fully God, fully man, who infinite in his being could absorb infinite wrath from his father as he stood in the place of sinners piled up with infinite debt. Only the God man could do that. Jesus' resurrection demonstrates that his substitutionary sacrifice was sufficient to wipe out every sin for those who believe. The resurrection 
says John Calvin, often set before us as the assurance of our salvation. It is not to draw away our attention from his death, but simply because it bears witness to the efficacy and the fruit of his death. How do we know our salvation is secure, believers? Because the tomb is empty. What does that prove? It proves that payment was accepted. That our sins are gone forever and victory over death is secure. You could not bring Christ down. You could not bring Christ up. And while the path of law righteousness says, I got this, while every religion of man says, I got this. It is the sham hypocrisy of human achievement. It's the path everybody is born on. Everybody walks that path in one way or another. And it is a wearisome, hard, impossible, and eventually hypocritical path. You understand the psychology of walking on that path. You think naively, oh yeah, there's rules out there. I I can keep those. And then you can't. You're like, oh, I need to try harder. Maybe I need a different system. Maybe I need a different guru. Maybe I need a different religious book. Maybe I need a different pilgrimage or different alms. Maybe I need to make up more for what I've done. Maybe I need penance or confession or a whole host of sorry attempts that humans make to try to earn a righteousness they could never get. And you can't live there psychologically forever. You become schizophrenic. If you're still holding the standard up here but recognizing you can't meet it, you become like Martin Luther who goes to his confessor hour after hour and spends three hours in the confessional booth saying all of his sins that he can think of walks out and then walks right back in and says, I was proud because I confessed. (laughs) And he's wearing out his confessors. (laughs) But that's because he got it. (laughs) He wasn't the crazy one. The system that said you could earn it is the crazy system. And the human psyche goes schizophrenic trying. And if you've been on the hamster wheel, spinning and spinning and spinning and running and running and running, and you need off the wheel, let me tell you, you need Jesus Christ. You need to get on the path that begins in verse 8. But the righteousness of of faith speaks as follows. What does it say? It's near to you. We'll dive into that next week. If you're here this morning and you went off the hamster wheel, the the vain, empty race of trying to merit heaven by what you do, you gotta know there's freedom. (laughs) Deliverance from your burden. Listen, some people cover that up. You, You get to a crisis moment, you say, I can't do it, but the standard's still here you know what, maybe the standard isn't there. Maybe just God really likes people who sort of try sometimes. You can't lower the standard. You wake up one day in eternity and realize the standard hasn't changed. And the free gift of life was there for you and you rejected it in exchange for the trash you kept trying to offer. Give up. As some get off the hamster wheel and they say, forget religion, <laughs> forget trying. I'm on a highway to hell and I'm going to love it. Hell's a party. I'm going there with my friends. May as well enjoy the ride. And you pile up more judgment against yourself. Knowing all the while that you're accountable for those things, you can't escape what God has put in the heart. If you're here this morning and you've not surrendered to the gospel, the good news, and a good savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to know he's everything. You give up trash to get him. And he invites sinners to come to him. Romans 10 is a great, big, huge invitation. No one's disappointed coming to Christ. All who call on the name of the Lord will be saved. Would you come to him? Believer, you you just know your path of faith righteousness It's not a path you could ever figure it out by yourself. (laughs) Let God's grace keep us humble and let God's grace keep us 
proclaiming that good news to those who so desperately need it around us. Let's pray together. Lord Jesus, it is not what our hands have done that would merit right standing before you, but only what you have accomplished fully and completely and thoroughly forever. That you would declare the ungodly to be righteous, that you would forget our sins that you would separate them from us as far as east is from west, that you would make that which was as scarlet be white as white wool and like snow. Too good to be true, and yet it is true for all who love you. Oh God, would you be pleased to draw anyone here this morning who does not yet know freedom in Christ to the one and only Savior on the only path to heaven. And we ask it in his name. Amen.